Freedom is a cliff that overlooks the abyss, the valley of the shadow of death. In Shin Megami Tensei, one of the more prominent motifs is that of the player shaping the world based on their ideology. The third game in the series, Nocturne, represents this theme through its central conflict surrounding reasons, which are essentially a philosophy which will be used as a blueprint for the future world. This is where it diverges from the older games in the series, in that previously, the alignments were essentially just political groups vying for power. However, in Nocturne, the universe is quite literally metaphysically structured in such a way that someone's ideology becomes the basis for how the world functions. Due to this change, the reasons become much more personal. They represent the worldviews of the specific characters we see throughout the game. In this way, Nocturne shifts the focus from a social struggle to an internal one. This is developed further by using Buddhist imagery as a metaphor for character growth, in a setting where characters are forced to change. The easiest example of this is Usamu Nida. While Nocturne is often believed to have little writing, I'd argue he has one of the most clear-cut character arcs in the series. He starts off as a coward, who has to rely on others to accomplish his goals, but when he realizes that there's no one he can rely on, he rejects companionship entirely. His reason, Masubi, is premised on total isolation for everyone. We can see a similar arc for Chiaki Hayasaka, and while Hakawa doesn't have one, this theme of growth, and by proxy, agency, is central to the game. And this begs the question, what happens to those who can't change? Enter Yuko Takao and her patron goddess, Aradia. Note, this video will be full of Nocturne spoilers. If you're not cool with that, now is the time to skip. The first two sections of this video are strictly history, so if you haven't played the game yet, you may still want to watch those first for context, but if you don't care, it's whatever. Finally, I would advise everyone watching this to go watch my other video, Nocturne Conception in the Womb. You don't need to, but it would help contextualize the game's themes. So before we can talk about the themes surrounding these characters, we have to talk about where the name Aradia comes from. It's said to be a bastardization of Erodiaide, which is itself the Italian version of the name Herodias. So who is that? Well, like always at KC Enterprises, our story begins in the Bible, this time with a man named John the Baptist. For those who aren't aware, John the Baptist is a pretty important figure in the Christian mythos. To give you a short resume, this man is said to be the cousin of Jesus Christ, and would later go on to baptize him. In fact, in Mark 6.14, it's shown that people thought Jesus was him, implying that John was also a widely known and respected man. This rumor would eventually reach the ears of King Herod Antipas, the son of THE King Herod. You know, the guy who has the Bible story about ordering the deaths of all the babies near the city of Bethlehem in fear of Jesus' birth. That said, Antipas knew the rumor was false because he himself had John the Baptist executed. Why? According to the Bible, it was for his wife, Herodias. There is the connection. And if you'll notice, there's a theme budding here. In Mark 6.18, the reason why the biblical Herodias was upset with John was due to his disapproval of her marriage with Antipas. Herodias had actually divorced her previous husband, Philip the Tetrarch, to marry Antipas. But the funny thing is, Philip and Antipas were actually brothers. This was a clear violation of Mosaic law, specifically Leviticus 20.21. So it makes sense that a priest would be upset at the ruler of his people for not following their customs. From here, we can follow the biblical narrative as told in Mark 6, 21 through 28. It opens with Antipas holding a banquet for his birthday. To entertain the host of local political leaders that were present, Antipas' wife's daughter Salome performed a dance. This greatly pleased the audience and led to Antipas promising her anything she desired, even offering half his kingdom. When Salome heard this, she asked her mother what to request. Herodias replied, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Antipas was said to be stricken with grief, because not only did he fear John for being a righteous man, but he was actually intrigued by John's preaching. However, he was honor-bound to respect the oath he made in front of guests. He ordered a soldier to decapitate John in prison, and John's head was delivered to Salome, who gave it to her mother as a gift. Now one thing we have to address here is the veracity of these claims. It's generally understood by scholars that these events were largely fictional, and effectively acted as Christian propaganda. In the Antiquities of the Jews, the historian Josephus discusses the same event, but entirely foregoes any mention of Herodias, saying, Herod, who feared that the great influence John had over the masses might put them into his power, and enable him to raise a rebellion, for they seemed ready to do anything he should advise, thought it best to put him to death. We can view the Bible's framing of this story as part of a long-standing Abrahamic tradition of the demonization of women. Compare this to other biblical figures like Eve, who is often given blame for the fall of man, and Jezebel, wife of King Ahab, who was blamed for the corruption of Israel due to her support of the god Baal. Jezebel would later become a symbol for false prophets, as seen in Revelations 2.20, and is even today used to symbolize sinful femininity. All of this forms a cultural context for a future development in 1886 with a man named Charles Godfrey Leland. 
he would take interest in the topic of Italian witchcraft upon hearing about a so-called secret religion through undisclosed means. This led him to contact a woman named Madalena, who he referred to as a collector of folklore, as she was in the middle of traveling through Tuscany, which is a region in central Italy. Eleven years later, in 1897, Leland would receive a manuscript titled The Vangel, referencing the Italian word Vangelo, meaning gospel. The Vangel contained a series of religious practices and spells, but what we're going to focus on here are its myths. The third chapter describes its creation story. It explains that the first being was Diana, the primordial darkness. She divided herself to create her second half, Lucifer of the light, god of the sun and the moon. But Diana lusted after her brother's son, and when he rejected her advances, she made herself mortal, on the advice of the fathers and mothers of the beginning. At this point, Lucifer had also taken mortal form, having fallen from grace. Using her supernatural powers to shapeshift, she took advantage of Lucifer in his sleep, which led to the birth of their daughter, Aradia. When Lucifer awoke, he was enraged, but again, Diana used her powers, this time to placate and then charm him into being her lover. Diana's deep fascination with the magical arts would eventually lead her to be declared the Queen of the Witches by all of the spirits of the world. Going back to chapter 1, we find the story of Aradia. The book speaks of humankind having a large disparity between the rich and the poor. The rich made slaves of the poor, taking the authority to imprison and torture them. Many slaves would flee the cities and find refuge in the countryside. Here they became bandits and assassins, stealing from and even killing their former masters. Diana saw this and went to have Aradia teach the humans the secrets of witchcraft. Their goal was to poison the rich, curse their lands with harsh weather, and to mock the Catholic priests, saying, Your God, the Father, and Maria are three devils. For the true God the Father is not yours. For I have come to sweep away the bad, the men of evil, all will I destroy. The techniques and practices found in this book are said to have been passed down from this moment by Aradia. Leland released all of this in 1899 in a book titled The Gospel of the Witches, or simply Aradia. He framed all of this as describing Le Vecchia Religione, an Italian term that translates to the old religion. Going further to claim it has roots possibly going as far back as Etruscan times, he even denied any inspiration from Catholicism, rejecting the work's clear parallels to Abrahamic religion, arguing that it was a distinct belief system and that its similarities were due to the church's appropriation of pagan symbols and stories. That said, Leland's book shouldn't be seen as representative of broader Italian witchcraft and is, at best, reflective of a local culture. There are many aspects of this book that simply don't add up. For example, Leland arguing that the book described beliefs held by witches thousands of years ago. He went as far as to posit that the followers of this belief system could still be controlling secret societies in the corners of the countryside, hidden away from the control of the church. This claim is very dubious, considering there are no other records of such a culture. Not only that, but his image of a witch holding Sabbaths in the woods was an archetype entirely made by the church to justify exercising their authority. This was due to a series of social changes occurring during the shift from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, which led to the end of an era where the Catholic Church was largely unquestioned. In fact, the most severe witch hunts occurred in areas where their influence was the weakest, such as France, Germany, and Switzerland. The myth of the witch was mostly invented by the Dominican Order, which was also very heavily involved in the Inquisition. The Inquisition itself was created in the 13th century as a response to a series of alternative sects of Christianity that were seen as heretical, such as the Bogomils, also known as the Cathars, or the Waldensians. But by the 1250s, these groups became largely irrelevant due to their religious oppression which destroyed their communities and left them without any influence. What's interesting here is that this didn't lead to the Inquisition winding down, but on the contrary, they actually expanded their targets to the Jews, Muslims, and eventually witches. The heat against witches would eventually reach new heights with the release of the book The Malleus Maleficarum, which was written by Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Spangler, two members of the Dominican Order. It clearly defined witches as devil worshippers that were actually in league with Satan. They stood in direct opposition to the church and represented the antithesis of everything Christianity stood for. This book was very influential on the public perception of witches and was actually one of the first books printed on the printing press. It's worth noting here that prior to the fear-mongering, the official stance of the Catholic Church was that witchcraft wasn't even real. The canon Episcopi held that it was purely delusions sent from Satan, dreams that held no bearing on physical reality, even comparing them to biblical visions of God seen by the apostles. Funnily enough, the text actually specifically mentions followers of Diana and Herodias as examples of demonic illusions. But back on topic, Leland himself was not the most trustworthy source. The finished work was heavily edited by Leland and largely reflects his own personal views on society and especially the Catholic Church. When the historian Marion Gibson observed his documents after his death, she noted that he identified with the witches he wrote about. 
The inaccuracy of his writing was also well known throughout the academic community even during the time he was active. The author of his obituary, Frederick York Powell, wrote of him, he could and did make careful and exact notes, but when he put his results before the public, he liked to give them the seal of his own personality and to allow his fancy to play about the stories and poems he was publishing. But regardless, the Gospel of the Witches has found its place as a foundational work of neo-paganism, a system of beliefs based around rebuilding the religions of pre-Christian peoples. The appeal they found in Leland's work is self-evident. Leland effectively viewed himself as a sort of feminist and despised the power held by the church and members of the upper class. He gave them a narrative and an established history. Furthermore, his repackaging of Catholic propaganda concerning witch religions flips the narrative to frame them as heroes. This reflects later neo-pagans repurposing patriarchal symbols for empowerment. This brings us back to Nocturne. The Maniac's version of the game gives us one very apparent way that all of this ties into the character. In the third Kalpa, the Lady in Black gives us a glimpse into Aradia's background, saying, Power. It is what all humans seek. It is built into them. Whether it is the power of light or the power of darkness, people rely on it and pray. They do so wishing for greater power. In fact, a woman you know quite well prayed to a goddess in hopes of saving the world. Let me tell you about that particular deity. Aradia herself is a tragic savior born of dreams. She emerged in response to the cries of witches who were persecuted for their beliefs. The witches prayed to Aradia for power and freedom. They also prayed for people to be saved from the hardships of life. However, Aradia never showed herself on Earth, nor did she save anyone. She was a being who could only give hope to her believers. Humans, whom God created, created a god of their own. Anything is indeed possible within the vast ocean of Amala. Nevertheless, Aradia is still an outsider. There is little that she can do in a vortex world where her existence is forbidden. She is merely a goddess of forsaken freedom. This version of the quote is from the localization of the Nocturne HD remake, I think the game's original localization is a much more apt description. He or she is called a fake goddess. Now what makes her a so-called fake goddess? In regards to her real-life counterpart, you could argue the overt embellishment lends to that label, but that doesn't really make sense for her depiction in SMT. I would argue that the biggest theme across this series is that all the demons and gods in the games are the products of human thought, or more precisely in Nocturne, their karma. I don't think there has to be any specific or precise answer to this question, because in my opinion, SMT lives and dies in the vagueness of its themes. However, my reading of this is that her title of fake goddess is on some level correlated with her failure to save her followers, and that this status comes with some vague restrictions. If we take the Lady in Black's words literally, it would seem as if Aradia is viewed as fake precisely because of her inability. She speaks of a shadow vortex world, where fictitious gods live, and that they seek out creation so they can become real. However, when we take this line of thought to its logical conclusion, I think it gets pretty questionable. As I said earlier, the struggle for reasons is an internal one, for character growth. This means that the game is retroactively blaming the witches for not self-actualizing themselves into overthrowing a tyrannical state that was persecuting them, which is, to say the least, very obviously unreasonable. I wouldn't really say it's on purpose, but the witches in the game are very clearly meant to reflect real-life people who got butchered. So I don't know about you, but not a big fan of this part personally. With that said, this does make sense when we look at SMT's broader themes concerning the neutral alignment. This series has historically positioned neutral as humanity moving beyond the machinations of gods so they can command their own futures. In this framing, Yuko and the witches turning to a god to solve their problems is clearly a bad thing, since you're supposed to be taking responsibility for yourself and acting personally. We can take this even further to Nocturne's themes of lack of agency. Aradia is arbitrarily labeled as fake which restricts her from technically being allowed to act in the Vortex world. This is presumably due to the rules set by Kagetsuchi, or whatever higher power. This also begs the question, if Aradia is breaking some sort of rule, would Kagetsuchi even recognize her? The freedom ending itself is pretty clearly disliked by Kagetsuchi, and the means by which Aradia acts within the Vortex world is also distinct from the reason sponsors. Unlike the others who present themselves in a physical body, and seem to require some sort of sacrifice, Aradia simply takes possession of Yuko's body whenever she feels like it, 
And again, there is no clear answer for this. The game doesn't even pretend to care, but it's just kind of interesting to think about. Now that we've discussed what being a fake goddess means to Aradia, let's talk about how this reflects on Yuko Takao. I think her entire arc can be summarized by one of her own quotes. How can I control the world when I can't even take control of my own life? The biggest theme across her arc is failure. Specifically, a failure due to a lack of her own resolve. Yuko doesn't have her own clearly defined vision of the future, but she can still recognize when she doesn't like certain aspects of society. This makes her somewhat of a reactionary. To illustrate this, let's look at two of her quotes. First, the monologue that she gives in the obelisk. To be honest, I couldn't stand the way things were before. We claimed to want peace, yet nobody took any personal responsibility for the world's problems. We were selfish to the core. Not only that, we were miserable, though no one would admit it if you asked. Our indolence fed our complacence. And did anyone seek to better themselves or raise the bar for humanity higher? No, because they saw no value in it. That's how I saw the world. In my mind, a world like that might as well one day blink out of existence. This is what led her to Hikawa. Her lack of a vision compels her to latch on to people she thinks can help her. This brings us to our second quote from when you meet her in Yoyogi Park. She says, As the one responsible for the destruction of the old world, it is my duty to shape the new one. The world cannot remain in a state of chaos, nor can it fall prey to Hikawa's ambitions. But as it stands, there's not much I can do. Here is illustrated that, when she's on her own, she loses all direction. The second she's freed from the obelisk, she keeps relying on other people. Literally one of the first things she says when she's about to leave is she will surely teach me the reason for creation. This sets the tone for her character arc and becomes her fatal flaw. Reasons are something you have to find on your own. They aren't given. The rest of the main cast had already realized their reason before meeting their sponsor. Hikawa makes this more clear in his diet building monologue chastising her outright saying that she couldn't discern her reason because she kept running away. He goes further by questioning her belief in freedom, and asks her why she brought the students to the Vortex world in the first place, which I think is a very interesting question. I didn't think about this when I was in the middle of the game, but it was actively impeding on their goal. Only humans are supposed to be able to create a reason, and without the students, the assembly of Nihilo would have gained total control over the Vortex world with ease. No one could have allied with their enemies, and no one would have rescued Yuko in the first place. Hikawa even opposes this in the opening of the game, and only abides because Yuko threatens to stop cooperating with him. So I think it's a very reasonable conclusion that Yuko was ultimately unsure of herself. Due to her insecurities, what she ends up being most effective at is being a tool. Her role as a maiden is a very clear metaphor for this. In the world of Nocturne, Nagatsuhi is essentially an offering to a god. The reason all the humans are searching for more is to attract a reason sponsor. Then, if we factor in that a reason represents a character's philosophy, Yuko is being treated as both literally and figuratively as an instrument for Hikawa's success. As the Maiden, she collects Magatsuhi for Hikawa, which is used as a bludgeon against the mantra, their political enemies. The alignments have historically been used to represent political extremes, so if we adapt this theme to Nocturne, I'm not really sure how to interpret this as anything but how centrists can become useful idiots and get weaponized to whatever end. With that said, how does all of this play into the freedom ending, and how does this tie into the broader ethos of neutral endings across the series? Now I'm going to preface this section by saying that I do acknowledge that the alignments aren't all consistent across every game, and even more so in Nocturne's case, considering that it's actively diverging from the conventional alignments. However, I will maintain that there are still some clear thematic similarities that are worth discussing while looking at broader series trends. First, let's establish what neutral represents across the series. I would argue that neutral is more clearly defined by what it isn't than what it is. The major conflicts in this series are normally framed as giant fights between two extremes that ends up leaving regular Tokyo citizens in the middle of a conflict they never asked for. While these two extremes have pretty clear political motivations, neutral normally doesn't make a position in that regard. Generally, the most they'll say is, we need to stop the people tearing the world apart, and that's not a real political position. Now what neutral does stand for is humanity's autonomy and a vague hope for the future. This is because chaos, and especially law, tend to be controlled behind the scenes by a higher power. These gods leading the alignments, in turn, become a metaphor for people giving up control of their lives to other people. So when neutral rejects law and chaos, they are taking charge of their lives, and foregoing these extremes allows them to fight towards a brighter future. However, this in turn means that neutral becomes a conservative ideology because it is implicitly fighting for the status quo. It pushes to maintain society as it is right now. In 1992, 
The neutral alignment was described like so, by SMT1's director, Yosuke Nino. The neutral faction are basically humanitarians, without any radical or extreme beliefs. Unlike those who follow law, they seek personal freedom above all else. However, because they are conservative, they tend to adopt a policy of don't rock the boat. They care little about the outside world, which causes them to become more and more withdrawn and unaware of the things happening around them. Now, how do we know that the freedom route is a neutral ending? Well, the official Nocturne Guide says it, but that's not the fun way to prove it, right? So let's talk about it. I think the most apparent thing is that the ending results in a reset. The world returns to how it was before the conception. The more complicated aspect of this is freedom's place in the narrative. The ending is unique because it breaks the established rules for reasons built up across the game. Not only is Demifiend not sponsored by a god, but he's directly told that, as a demon, he cannot create a reason. However, when we get to the end of the game, Kagatsuchi refers to Demifiend's ideology as an unnamed reason, and the game goes out of its way to push this distinction to the player. When questioning Yuko, Hikawa asserts that freedom is opposed to the way of creation via the reasons. Then later, when Yuko dies, she says, All possibility has dried up in this world, which seems to agree with Hikawa's point of view. Granted, I do think this is odd, since last she spoke, she considered her views as being conducive to a reason, but maybe she changed between that time, especially considering that talk with Akawa. We can get more insight into this view if we go back to Kagatsuchi's monologue. He says, Your heart longs for the kingdom of freedom, a world that has no set future. Will you disregard the world's past sins to pursue such an idea? while describing Demifiend as, you with a heart that follows no rule. Now consider how Nocturne frames the reasons as teleological goals, in the sense that they're guides as to how someone should live and the world should function. This is set within a reframing of how previous games represented the Samsara, the cycle of reincarnation, as being how humankind shifts between political extremes, with Neutral trying to find a reasonable middle ground. When we consider reasons as being part of the cycle, and that the Vortex world is based around a set of arbitrary rules and conflicts, Freedom fits neatly as neutral, as it rejects the dogma of meaningless leaders and gods. In this lens, it makes more sense why Hakawa would speak as if there's more freedom in the previous world, considering that they wouldn't be compelled to live a certain way. It's worth noting here that in the older Mega Ten games, the extremism of the alignments was in the specific context of the harsh conditions the world was in. This also puts Kagatsuchi's statement in a new light, and I quote, Will you disregard the world's past sins to pursue an ideal? This is a tell to how Neutral idealizes the past, because they don't seriously question it and how it ultimately feeds into these bad outcomes, in favor of some vague hope. The perfect example for this is Strange Journey. In the Neutral ending, you stop the Schwarzwald from swallowing the Earth, but you don't actually challenge the reality that caused it. This is similar to what occurs in Nocturne since the clock just gets reset. There's even a voice implied to be Lucifer that outright tells you there is something still out there coming after you. On top of this, Nocturne frames freedom as if it's defined by risk. This is what Aradia normally talks about in her cryptic messages. Her comments can be hard to parse without context because she speaks in riddles, but consider what we've already spoken about as we go over this quote. Freedom is the cliff that overlooks the abyss, the valley of the shadow of death. The grave awaits even Victor at the end of the road. Show me your heart. Fool who bears the name Freedom. Because of your name, you will carry the burden of plague, pain, and ridicule. Do you fear the suffering and humiliation? Fool who bears the name Freedom. Because of your name, you will live a life of betrayal, rejection, and defeat. You fear the deceit. The torment. Aradia is telling the player that her path is difficult, outright calling them a fool for considering it. On a surface level, this is Aradia referring to how you reject the reasons. You're necessarily going to have to fight the rest of the world. However, I think this is also meant to tie into Neutral's broader theme of humanity, to evoke the argument that risk-taking is an essential human act. I say this because this is often used as a major argument against law. Law is often used to represent a static or stagnant society. I think this is worth mentioning because Kagatsuchi and Nocturne was intended to be an equivalent of. And going further, looking at the imagery from the Kalpas, the system of conceptions becomes overtly law-coded in the game itself. This context, in turn, also grants new meaning to Kagatsuchi's monologue about freedom. The Great Will once granted the world freedom, in hopes that it would evolve to a new level. 
However, it was that freedom which gave rise to evil, brought darkness, and led the world to destruction. Freedom is the seed of disaster. Its sole fruit is ruin. To me, this reads as a rejection of possibility due to a risk that led to failure. Sadly, they don't go into depth with this, but funnily enough, it's reminiscent of an Aradia quote where she says, If you deem yourself right, light will return to the world, but so will darkness. This leads us to Aradia's own ideology. Aradia's position revolves around everyone's personal autonomy, and in this way, her personal views become a sort of microcosm of the game's themes. Back in the Obelisk, Aradia tells a player to reject the opinions of others, follow their own beliefs, and experience the world on their own. A key piece of dialogue here is her saying, you yourself are a world too. This is an allusion to the metaphor of the Vortex world, where it and the reasons represent personal growth. I think an interesting part about her philosophy is that her freedom knows no bounds. She tells the Demifiend, remember that you are what is right, that is my truth. Because the most important aspect to her is believing in yourself. Later when speaking to Hikawa, she even says that his belief in Shijima is its own form of freedom. Now where these themes diverge more from conventional neutral is once again with Yuko Takao. Not because it goes against its ethos, but because Yuko functions as a warning. It's interesting to note that while we discuss that neutral rejects gods, the Lady in Black introduces Aradia by saying this. Power. It is what all humans seek. It is built into them. Whether it is the power of light or the power of darkness, people rely on it and pray. They do so wishing for greater power. Here we have them established from the jump that Aradia is tied to people yearning for a god to protect them, and this is where her role as a fake goddess comes in. It's possible that this was meant to be a sort of faux neutral through the witches that amount to failure due to their half measures. I think it's worth pointing out that by the time Yuko dies, Aradia leaves the plot, leaving Demifiend on his own with no one to guide him. So where Yuko fails, Demifiend succeeds. Here we come to the reaffirmation of the conservative aspect of neutral. Once the status quo has been restored, Yuko thanks Demifiend and explains her mistake by saying her negative feelings clouded her worldview. She leaves saying, no matter what happens, she's going to believe in herself. While this sounds happy, it has a pretty dark meaning when you think about it. These closing messages suggest that someone shouldn't try to change the world if they're going through a struggle. This meaning becomes even more clear when we recall, since this is a reset, this is presumably before she helps start the conception. Consider once more that the alignments are used to represent political extremes and effectively frame all social change as radical. This ending, like many neutral endings across the series, ends up supporting the status quo by default since any deviation from the world that we already live in is too extreme, too dangerous, and too thoughtless for some arbitrary reason. Isn't it funny how that works out?